Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Ganpati, a practicing pediatrician from Mumbai. The topic for the day, voiding disorder, and this is being discussed on the STEER platform, an educational initiative by my teacher, Dr. Y.K. Ambedkar. When you talk about voiding and the micturation cycle, there are three phases in it, filling, storage, and continence. And there is an interplay between neural, anatomical, and functional elements. And any aberration and abnormalities in these elements can give rise to a voiding dysfunction. Let's take the symptomatology of a voiding disorder. Let's take storage. So under storage, we have frequency, we have nocturia, we have urge incontinence. Any frequency less than two or any frequency more than 7 is considered to be abnormal. So if the frequency is less, it becomes an underactive bladder. If it is more, it is an overactive bladder. Nocturia, when you have to get up repeatedly in the night to pass urine. Urge incontinence, you have an overactive bladder, a detrusor instability that makes you run to the toilet because you are afraid that there may be an accident and you may wet your man. So urge incontinence. Coming down to voiding. You get to the toilet. It takes time to initiate the urination. That is called hesitancy. Like we see in elderly patients with benign hyperplasia of the prostate. You can have an intermittent stream which comes out in spurts when you have a dissynergy between your bladder and the outlet. You can have a weak stream wherein you have to use your abdominal muscles to completely evacuate your bladder or you get a feeling of incomplete evacuation at the end of evacuation. You can have dysuria which also comes under the category of voiding. The last category is continence. Under the umbrella term continence, you can have incontinence, which could be continuous, and this could be an anatomical aberration. You could have an ectopic ureter coming out onto the labia, and there is a complete or continuous wetting of your underpants. It could be intermittent post void dribble and this is pretty common in obese girls wherein they use the English toilet the knees are close to each other the thighs are not well spread there is a little bit of leak into the introitus while passing urine and when you get up this amount of urine that has leaked into the vagina comes out this is called vaginal voiding you can have incontinence also when the intra-abdominal pressure goes up. What we all know as stress incontinence. Valsalva manoeuvre, trying to lift a heavy weight, coughing, giggle incontinence. When there is a complete evacuation when you laugh. Otherwise, the sphincters do a very good job of maintaining the integrity of storage of the bladder. And now we are seeing a new entity called as extraordinary daytime urinary frequency called as polacuria, usually between five and seven years of age, wherein we see children with stressors tending to go to the toilet very frequently, no accidents, and it takes a few, a few months before they settle. And there is no neurological or structural aberration. In the management of avoiding disorder, the most important thing is asking the bowel history. You need to understand there is a very close relationship between the bowel and the bladder. The embryological origin is the same. The neural input is more or less the same. There are adjacent structures in the pelvis. And if the bladder, if the bowel is full, the bladder is irritated. So constipation is one thing that needs to be treated before you jump into the management of avoiding disorder. And it's termed as the bubble bladder dysfunction or diselimination syndrome. The additional things in history taking would be developmental history, 
hyperactivity, Down syndrome, growth, because growth can be affected in conditions with polyuria like diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus or a tubular issue, uh, any surgery in the past on the spine. And you definitely have to take a history for stressors. So a birth of a new child, separation in the family, uh, a change in school, and sexual abuse, especially when it is secondary aneurysis, that is six months of continence and then you have become incontinent again. On examination, we are just trying to rule out all the red flag signs. So we look at the abdomen and see if there is a midline swelling just above the pubis, that's the bladder. So you definitely know that there might be an outlet issue. So you have a thickened bladder, trabaculated bladder. You could have a fecal mass felt on the sides and that would tell you uh, that this child is constipated. You need to look at the spine for uh, evidence of neural tube defects in the form of a tuft of hair, hemangioma, lipoma, cafe oily spots in the midline, the gluteal cleft, the flattened buttocks, and the reflexes like the anal reflex, the bulbocavernous reflex, the cremastric reflex, reflex of the lower limb and gait to rule out neurological issues. You need to look at the introitus and you need to look at the penile structure for aberrations in the form of meatal stenosis. It could be uh, hypospadias, it could be a urethral diverticulum, which, could, which is not very obvious from the outside. You could have vaginitis and urethritis when there is a chronic incontinence and a perianal rash or telltale marks of abuse or an anti-post anus, especially when a child is constipated. So some of the things that you need to look for in investigation, in addition to vitals, if you get a high blood pressure, you have an auricular abnormality, you have pallor, start thinking of renal. Coming to investigations, we do a urine routine, specific gravity, proteinuria, hematuria, pyuria, you require culture and don't miss out on calcium, hypercalciuric states. The next thing that we do is an ultrasound, which will tell you the state of the bladder, pre-void, post-void residue, and also you look at the rectal diameter for constipation. You also look at the kidneys and the ureter for VUR and hydronephrosis. And an ultrasound and a urine routine gives you a lot of information. In addition, two things that you should not miss out is a micturating diary or a micturation diary or a bladder diary as it is called, where you have an input-output chart for, the, for 48 hours at least. The type of fluids that you take, the total amount of fluids that have gone in, the amount of fluids that have come out, the type of stool you have passed, the frequency of urination, the amount of urine with every urination. So you could calculate a functional bladder capacity. You could know whether there is polyuria. You could know if there is an urgent continence and the number of accidents and the type of stool based on the Bristol scale. Very informative in giving you a provisional diagnosis. The second one is a video when the child urinates. So when you take a video, when the child urinates, you know the posture, which can be rectified by you. Second, what you can do is you know the stream, whether there is any hesitancy, whether there is any intermittent strain, whether the abdominal muscles are used for initiation of urination. So you get a lot of information from these two things before you jump into higher investigations in the form of uroflowmetry with EMG of the pelvic floor. Uh, avoiding cystourethrography, an MRI of the spine when you're thinking of a neural tube defect, a cystoscopy, and the other test, the highly specialized ultrasounds which are done rectally. And all these things are done at higher centers. In therapy, the most important thing is in functional voiding disorders, it is education before medication. And what is the education that we do? Timed voiding, fluid distribution, toilet training, 
and we teach them posturing in the toilet. And this goes a long way in management of avoiding disorder. Thank you.